Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Lawrence County in Ohio, it was an unusually warm February that year, me and three other friends of mine decided to go out and spend the night in the strip mines to kind of get away from things and shoot guns and just have a little fun without disturbing anyone. We arrived at the pull-off about noon and proceeded to hike the two miles to where Crystal Lake was located. When we arrived at the lake, we set up a small fire and our sleeping bag on a small knoll overlooking the lake and then went down the hill to an old road and walked about a mile or so when my friend Darren found a large footprint in the clay-like mud off the side of the road. We were all amazed at how big this print was. I wore a size 12 boot and it was at least four inches longer than my boot. It was a very fresh track, so fresh that I could make out the loops and swirls on the pads of the toes and part of the sole. We got really nervous and a little scared because we all had a lot of experience in the woods hiking and hunting and none of us had ever believed or seen anything about Bigfoot. But we changed our minds very quickly after seeing that print. We made our way back to the camp and sat around the fire and just kind of took it all in and discussed what we had found and tried to dismiss it and go on with our trip. Later on in the evening, we heard normal woodland creatures and birds, but it got very quiet and nothing made a sound for hours. We were getting scared and wondered if we should leave, but curiosity got the best of us and we decided to stay the rest of the night. We ate dinner at about 7 p.m. and sat around the fire and talked until exactly 11.23 p.m. I will remember the exact time as long as I live. We heard what can be described as a cross between a bark and a scream from below our camp near the lake shore. It was the most unnerving thing I have ever heard. We all just sat and stared at each other unable to talk or move. This went on for about five minutes until about half a mile away we heard another answer the first with a series of high-pitched barks and screams. That is when we decided it was time to go home. But we were afraid to leave the same way we had come because we would have to walk past the area where we had heard the scream at first. We decided to walk up another level and skirt the cliffs around the back of the lake, but when we made it up to the step above us, we ran right into whatever was making the sound. I was in front and had a mag light. The beam hit the midsection of the creature, and I stopped dead in my tracks. I observed a seven to eight foot tall creature standing not more than ten feet away from me. As I shined the light up, I saw red eyes. I have hunted all sorts of animals, and I have never seen one with red eyes that seemed to glow in the dark. I backstepped and almost knocked over everyone behind me, and the creature ran up an embankment, and we all ran back to the fire and sat back to back until we decided to go ahead and go back to the road and make our way to the car. We made it to the road and started walking the two miles to our car all the while listening to the two creatures yelling and screaming. One was behind us, and the other was on our right, flank pacing us from about 10 to 15 yards. Earlier in the day, we had passed a huge pile of old tires someone had dumped. But when we got to that point of the road, about 30 of the tires were thrown out into the road like someone or something didn't want us to leave. We made it to the car, and we all piled in and left as fast as the car would go. We never discussed it with anyone, or even among ourselves, 
because we were afraid of the ridicule and people thinking we were crazy. There were four of us, and we all saw and heard the same thing. We were sitting around a campfire, talking and eating. Vesuvius Lake is located about five miles north of the area where we were located, and both are part of the Wayne National Park, and I have heard of sightings in that area. We found the tracks at about 3 p.m. The sounds started at exactly 11.23 p.m. It is an area of reclaimed strip mines, lots of pine trees, a large lake on one side, and a smaller lake on the other side. On to the next one. In Ashtabula County in Ohio, the sighting took place on Austin Road between State Route 84 and Maple Street in the town of Geneva. While driving south down Austin Road between Maple Street and State Route 84, a mother and son had just passed the Welcome to Geneva, Ohio sign. All of a sudden, from the right side of the road, a very large, hair-covered animal walked across the road in plain view of their headlights. They could see it from the neck down, and estimated it was no more than 150 feet away. Both witnesses said they could see its left arm swinging as it walked, and it took only two and a half steps to cross the road. She said it was dark in color, while he thought it was much closer to be dark brown. The estimated height was eight feet tall, and the creature appeared very bulky from the side view. It was around 10.30 p.m. Other than her husband, Catherine has never told anyone in fear of ridicule. The area consists of third-generation deciduous forest with a small amount of pine species mixed within. A small creek flows through the area and eventually empties into Lake Erie. A few ravines were noted close to the area. The closest landmark to the north is the Welcome to Geneva, Ohio sign and a small trailer park. To the south, there is a set of railroad tracks about a half mile away from the siding location. On to the next one. I grew up in East Canton in Northeast Ohio and knew the surrounding forests quite well. From plenty of hiking time with my dad and friend, it was not a good day. I had an outrageous argument with my girlfriend and simply had to take off for a while. I decided to take to the woods for the night. I sometimes like to hike and camp by myself, but it wasn't my style at the time. I had just gotten a used Ford Tempo, which instantly changed my life. My days of woodland hiking and camping was over, for now anyway. At the time, I would have preferred to hit the mall or something meaningless like that. Thank God I didn't. I packed up a small supply of gear to go camping for a night all by my lonesome. I knew exactly where I was going. The spot was perfect. I had camped there before countless times. About two miles from my parents' house was an endless setting of woods. In these woods was a series of old abandoned coal mines. Above these caves was a gorgeous surrounding of pine trees. I'm not sure how they were able to root above the caves, but they made for an absolutely gorgeous setting. Nothing makes a better bed than pine needles. All I really brought was a blanket to lay on, which was my first mistake. A machete for chopping wood and the standard nighttime armor, my trusty flashlight. I always like to travel light and sometimes later regret it. You start to wish you would have brought a heavier blanket or a sleeping bag when it gets cold. My friends, Pete and Joe, came with me to help set up camp, which there wasn't much to it. I think they just wanted to hang out. So began the greatest quest of man, starting of the mystical fire. We made a huge clearing of the pine needles, so there was no chance of a spark to set it off, and laid rocks around it. We were always really careful about this because we knew the owner of the land, and he permitted us to hike or camp there any time we felt like it. The sun was setting fast. Pete and Joe had to leave because they had to work in the morning. I was glad, not that I didn't enjoy company, but I needed to be alone to ponder the things that man does wonder. The fire was going real well. Since it was August, 
the nights would get very cold. So, fire good, cold bad. At this point, I was finding peace. It was a stressful day, and well, I needed silence therapy. The wilderness can be intoxicating if you set your attention toward it, and a great way of getting away from everyday problems. Well, not this night anyway. At the time, I had pop bottle glasses. I mean, these suckers were thick, but I had perfect vision through them. Since then, I've had LASIK surgery, and you will read on my purpose for that very soon. So, I took my pop bottle glasses and very carefully laid them very close to my blanket. If you've ever owned glasses and cannot see very well, you will understand. This is an insecurity. A few twigs snapped around me. I'm not going to kid you. When you hear that kind of stuff when you're alone in the deep woods, it scares you for a minute. Ultimately, nothing I haven't heard before. I then realized it was something small, a little rabbit or a squirrel. I was quite comfortable. I fell asleep very fast. The doors of the unknown were to be opened. At 3 a.m., I wake with a very startled, uneasy feeling. I know I didn't have a nightmare, but I had a much more intense feeling that I was rudely awakened. Nothing seemed outwardly different with the camp, however. The weird sense was there. I'd felt this peculiar sense before. I'm not exaggerating, and I hope that the other people that have had the same kind of experience can relate to the sense. It was the feeling of being watched on an extreme level. Not your roundabout chill or alertness. I'm talking an intense sensation. That tingly sensation that tells you that you are not alone and danger may be near. This sensation was like a physical tingling behind my ears. It was like hypersensitivity. I guess like a spidey sense, if you will. I know I'm not Spider-Man, but if I was, this is probably what it would feel like when trouble was ahead. Also, all of you with glasses would know, I immediately rushed to find them and jam them onto my face. Dead silence. There isn't a cricket chirping, a tree frog singing, or anything. Just cold, dead silence. I, however, pass it off as a bad dream. Mind you, at this point, I still have not heard anything or understand why I seem to have been rudely awakened. I notice I am freezing. I am very cold and the fire is on its last red coals. I immediately lean over and start blowing on the coals to restart it. That's when it happens. I heard the most blood-curdling scream I've ever heard to this day. It sounded unnatural. This scream will never be able to be documented on paper by anyone. For anybody to understand it, unless they hear it themselves, it was simply terrifying and unnerving. The kind of sound that shoots right up your spine and seems to peek through your every nerve. The octave levels of this scream was beyond my comprehension. If I didn't have ears, I still would have heard it. Let me explain more on this heart-stopping scream. Your first animal instinct reaction is two choices. To curl up into a little ball and hope it goes away, which is what I was feeling at that moment, or flee as fast as you can. Those who hear this, that have had this experience, will know exactly what I'm talking about. This scream, I imagine, will haunt us for the rest of our lives. A quick note on the bizarre side. I also had the instinct to yell back. Don't ask me why. It was one of those feelings I had that I cannot explain. I did have to suppress myself to keep from yelling back. Maybe some kind of primal defense mechanism. I'm going into weird territory here, but I felt a connection like that. Maybe someone else had felt the same way, or else I'm totally nuts. I'm particularly interested in why I felt this. The fact is, it was a very surreal situation, and I didn't know how to react. I remember my first thought, and it was, you've got to be kidding me, because I have never heard anything like that in all my life. It sounded similar to apes I would have heard on the old National Geographic documentaries, but much louder. This was in Ohio, though, not Africa. And it wasn't just once. The screaming continued in approximately 5 to 10 second intervals on both ends of my camp. On each end, I heard rustling, 
and screams as if they were screaming back and forth. I was shocked once again when I saw something thumping across the land. Fear took over. A large, two-legged something thumped its way about 20 to 30 feet away through my camp. I say thumped because, if you remember, I was sleeping on top of a series of caves, which essentially was like a floor. So I felt every step this creature make. It didn't swing its arms around like a gorilla, but had features similar from what I could tell. However, I can 110% guarantee it was no man. It was a moonlit night, so I could see that it was very large and hairy. The top of its head reminded me of a gorilla. It was mostly hair covered, with some exceptions much like an orangutan. The hair color looked black, but could have had other colors in it. All dark hair looks black at night, and all hair has many colors that people don't immediately see without observation. It was a side view, so I did not see the eyes. I wish I could have. I cannot give you a valid height. I did not see the full height because it was running on a ledge, so I couldn't see below its calves. All I could see is it was massive. I'm giving you the best description I can give of what little time I had to observe the creature. It didn't pose for me. All I know is it was colossal, and I was frightened. My only conclusion at this point was that the ridiculous myth of Bigfoot was real. That, or I was losing my mind. I was still hearing the yell from the rear of the camp as well, which led me to believe there were two or more. One thing I should mention is, I did not smell the stench that so many encounters have mentioned, perhaps because it was such a still, windless night. My only instinct from that noise was, get out. Whatever it was, it was saying, you are not welcome here, in its own language. I heeded the warning. I obviously picked the wrong place to sleep. My dad always taught me not to run from wild animals because they sensed the fear. I grabbed my flashlight and left everything else, and fearfully walked out very fast. When I was about 20 feet away from the camping area, the continuous screaming ended. The silence was comforting to an extent. I no longer felt in the immediate danger that I thought I was initially in, and I did not hear anything following. When I cleared the woods and hit the road, I ran. I ran the entire distance to my parents' house, to what seemed like the hardest haul I ever pulled. My chest hurt from breathing so heavily. I urgently beat on my mom and dad's locked door. I did not live there anymore. Mom rushed to the door. Naturally, I had to catch my breath, but I eventually was able to recite what I just explained. Soon after, my dad arrived home from work, and then I told him, this is coming from a 19-year-old kid, mind you. They were good parents and listened. I'm not so sure they believed me, but they agreed something traumatic happened to me to set me in such a disturbed mood. My dad had been moral mushroom hunting for a few decades or more and had never seen anything like that before. Time has passed. I guess it was time to write all this down. I wanted to write this mainly for myself. I want to remember it as clearly as I can. Every detail... I recite in this is exactly how I remember it. No exaggeration. I would have through time discarded this as merely a psychological episode, but I have not finished the story for you. The next day was equally thrilling. I knew that if I mentioned this to too many people, it would be devastating. I had to tell someone what happened, and who better to tell than your trusting best friends, right? My two closest friends once again were Pete and Joe. I explained this to them and got the truthful expression from them that I expected. Pete believed me to an extent, I think, but Joe took me for an idiot, I think. Since I still was not on speaking terms with my girlfriend, the three of us decided to go camping in the same spot together. I wasn't about to take the day and go back by myself to retrieve my precious bear blanket. The word alone was not an option at this point in time. Why go back at all, you ask? Well, it's like this. When a man is alone, he is alone. When he's with his buddies, he's an Olympian. Besides, 
I knew that lightning never strikes more than once in the same place. I mean, come on, the chances of this same thing happening again were absurd. I was concerned, but didn't feel like it would happen again. That night, armed for battle, my friends and I headed for the woods once again. Much to my surprise, everything I left was untouched. Nothing out of the ordinary at all. No big fat footprints, no clumpy hair on tree branches, nothing. It was all still very dry from the summer. I already began to doubt my sanity. I'm a skeptic and generally believe nothing until I am presented with evidence. That is why we all elected to bring a tape recorder this time. We bought brand new batteries for this really cheap Radio Shack piece of junk recorder and set it up by our camp. Let me tell you a bit about my friend Joe. Where I pack light, he is the opposite. He was a Boy Scout and insisted on building his own personal living room right there in the woods. So where last night was blanket and machete, tonight was cot, tents, army gear, pellet guns, hot dogs and chips. Woohoo! Pete was very much like me. We were gung-ho and liked testing ourselves with having less. It's not like one night is much of a survival test. I only explain this to you to maybe get a grip on our personalities a little. So, you see, we were not Bigfoot enthusiasts on the hunt for the big score. We were casually camping out, as we had done many times before. In fact, the previous night rarely entered my mind until God turned the lights out on us. So, here we are, looking straight up into the starry sky through the pines with full bellies from complimentary snacks from Joe's workplace. Once again, a very clear and starry night. Slowly, we each dozed off, me being laughed at usual. I finally got comfortable with my surroundings. I convinced myself that the danger of last night that still seemed all too familiar was over. It's back to innocent camping. 3 a.m. on the nose, I awoke like clockwork. You ask, how could this be? I asked the same at that very moment when I looked at my watch. How could this be? I woke once again at the same exact moment from the night before, with that dreaded feeling of unease again. The fire seemed to be in the exact same condition, the coals slowly fading away. I was very cold again. The silence was unbearable. I looked over and see Pete was awake too, his eyes the size of quarters. He had a strange look of fear on his blood-drained face. I asked what was wrong. He just replied, I don't know. It was a repeat of last night's show, which I did not want to sit through. I knew something had happened yet again to startle us in this manner. I started blowing on the fire. The screams burst out just like the night previous. Once again, I am in a surreal situation. Over and over, I ask myself, how can this be? The scream echoes our wilderness surroundings with great intensity right when I am blowing on the fire. At the exact same time as the night before, I'm sure Bigfoot doesn't have the same synchronized Swiss Army watch strapped to his or her own wrist. I'm not sure why this happened on the nose again. One point I would like to make is on both nights. I was obviously rudely awakened by the scream, but couldn't remember it because I was coming out of sleep. That's the best I can conclude for waking up with that unease. Pete hits the recorder. We call for Joe. Nothing. We call once again. Finally, Pete kicks his cot. Joe snaps angrily. I'm awake. I'm awake. We ask if he hears the scream. He says he's been listening as well. Needless to say, I felt more comfortable with the situation this time. I knew I had survived the first night, and chances of surviving again are probably good. I'm not going to BS you, though. I was still terrified. Maybe not to the extent that Pete and Joe were. We knew we had to go. The screams were more prominent. We urge Joe to get up, but he replies in a cold, dead fear. I can't move. I had really never seen anyone so scared. He really just could not move. He was paralyzed from fear, and to this day, he won't admit it. We helped to motivate him. There was no sign of a large, two-legged mammal this time. None of us planned on sticking around to test that theory. Pete grabbed the recorder. Once Joe managed to secure his feet in his boot, 
we started our long trek out of the wood. When we were about 20 feet away from the camp, the horrendous scream stopped again. The only thing I take from this was they just didn't want us there. And once we were apparently leaving, they cut out the scare tactics. It worked. When we got to the trail, I wondered what would have happened had I looked behind us. What would I have seen on the trail if I would have simply turned my head back into that direction? Would I have seen that massive creature staring us down that I had seen the night before? I have nightmares to this day about that question. I wish I would have looked back at that time because it obviously wouldn't have been as horrifying as the unknown. I thought the dreams would stop once I moved out of the state, but I still have them. So now my friends believe me. It was a real rush because I really wasn't expecting it to happen twice in one life, much less two days. Pete and Joe both were walking very fast ahead of me and I tried to slow them down. I knew at this point the creature was probably content with seeing us leave. Since we parked our car closer by this time, my exit was much quicker than last night. The next morning, we awoke earlier than we should have. I think we may be topped two hours sleep. The fact is, we were eager to go see the sight. Being late teens meant high expectations. The mission was collect all the evidence we could find on site, then turn in the cassette tape with our solid proof of Sasquatch calls and collect a million dollars from top paying anthropologists and newspapers all over the world. Of course, this is ridiculous, but at that age, it seemed a possibility. In fact, it seems people are quicker to believe in making money will get rich overnight schemes than the existence of Bigfoot. We enter the woods, treating it like a crime scene. The patch of pine looks just like we left it from a distance. No three-inch deep massive footprints because the ground was incredibly dry. No patches of yak-type hair hanging from the trees. And no, not even a huge nest where a tribe of Sasquatch decided to have a sleepover. As we got closer, we did find some very interesting details. The cooler was hanging open. It had been rummaged through. The hot dogs were untouched. Does that tell you anything? And the chips were scattered all over the ground. Not at all how we left it. Mind you, there was no alcohol or drugs on our camp out because none of us touched the stuff on excursion. We were too G.I. Joe for that. We were very conscientious campers as far as neatness and tidiness goes. We ran a tight camp. A nifty little piece of evidence was the bread bag. We had two brand new bags of bread and buns. None of us had any bread the night before. Neither of us had any bread with our dogs. The twisty tie still remained intact. There were no claw marks or reminiscence of saliva. The bags had been simply pulled apart as if a human did it. Not a crumb left. We had plenty of footage to rummage through, but we knew it wouldn't be a good idea to play Sasquatch yells out in the middle of the woods for fear we would call the tribe. Hey, we were 19 and 20 years old, so when we got back, we started the player. To our immediate disliking was our apparent lack of knowledge with audio expertise. The sound was distorted. In our attempt to capture every single noise, we cranked the volume as high as it would go in recording. All this did was gather the sound of the motors of the machine running most of all. But there was sound. It was not a complete failure. Immediately, the haunting screams were apparent. I felt the hair raise on the back of my neck, reliving these moments in my mind. We heard ourselves leaving the campsite, yapping like the scared kids we were. Our Sasquatch calls were captured. Now, what do we do? Another surprise hit us about two weeks later. With several attempts to go on another camping excursion, all failed. I'm not sure if it was because we were all deep down, still recuperating from our last Bigfoot adventure, or if we were just too laid back into our boring small town lives once again. My mom called me at work and mentioned about a Bigfoot researcher being in town, and he was on the six o'clock news. She taped it on our old clunker machine, and I watched it when I got home. Enter Robert Morgan, anthropologist, Bigfoot hunter. It's just what we needed. I immediately called the news channel and requested Robert Morgan's phone number. Soon after, I was in touch with Morgan. He asked if I could meet him at his office in the city of Canton. 
Apparently, there had been many sightings of Sasquatch in this area at this very time, which is why he was there. This amazed me. I had no idea. He pointed out to me that there were, in fact, lots of sightings here and in Pennsylvania. From that point on, I heard stories all over from that area and in Columbiana County. Morgan reviewed the tape and yet Pete and I fill out reports for him. Joe did not come. He was still pretty shaken up to even talk about it. In fact, we have not discussed it until just recently. The next step was revisiting the site. I'd ultimately realized I had done all the right things to avoid a confrontation with a Yeti. He combed the site and between that and our description of what happened, speculated that we had been involved in a territorial dispute with two or more young males. Us being the dispute. Apparently, they liked the pine needle bedding more than we did. And the local water hole, which he said made sense. Years later, the mystery is still there. What would have happened if I would have had the courage to stay? I don't know, or will I ever. I would be joking myself if I thought these days I would have stayed longer. When I close my eyes and imagine that night from all those years ago, the hair still stands on my back. The fear of the unknown always gets the best of me. We had left Robert Morgan with our original sound recording. The next time I tried to call Morgan, he had already left the state to do research elsewhere. I know it wasn't the best recording, but it was our only evidence of this encounter and clear enough to hear. I was so excited when I heard the Columbiana County recordings because the sounds were so like ours. I recently got back in touch with Robert, and it was nice to hear he did remember us and our recordings. Morgan was extraordinarily helpful then, and even more so now. That day was a special day for me. It showed me scientists aren't the big dogs they make themselves out to be. If there was no mystery in life, then it would be too predictable for everybody. It was a day that took a large chunk out of my ordinary life and threw me right into my own X-Files. It was scary, exciting, mysterious, thrilling, and suspenseful, all rolled up into one. The skeptic in me sometimes says I just imagined all this, like a mass hypnosis or something. It all seems so real, but couldn't have been. The rational side of me butts in and says this really happened no matter how unbelievable the situation was, and my friends were there too to witness it. I was amazed, and I would invite it to happen any time of day or night again. I love the mystery of it, and there are so many opinions out there, but I know the real truth. These woods, people have stayed hidden for as long as they need to be. They have to be really good at it to avoid all the people fighting to get footage with tripwire cameras and such. I walked into those woods as the king and walked out far less than that. All out there that have experienced this can relate to that amount of vulnerability associated with this. What I saw and heard was not Harry and the Hendersons. I didn't get the chance to have s'mores with it. I'm not saying it was mean either, but darn persistent. It was just a great experience into the unknown that I can call my own and that's enough for me. On to the next one. The craziest thing about this sighting was the location in which it had occurred. Considering all the areas in Yosemite that one would consider desolate and lightly traveled, the Bridal Veil Trail would not be one of them. This particular trail is predominantly hard pack with very little elevation change or anything else for that matter. There are a decent amount of rock climbers in the area and a fair amount of foot traffic from all kinds of people who want to see the fall. In fact, a lot of single chicks come here in hopes of increasing their chances of marriage, according to the Indian legend. At any rate, Carol and I were relatively alone this day in May of 2007. We were working our way down the trail. The two of us have been on this trail numerous times, as we have on many of the trails in Yosemite. We were coming up on an area where there is a creek that is thrown so heavily with boulders that it's hard to even say it's a creek. 
As we were approaching, we heard the sound of a large rock cracking down on top of some other rocks. There was no question in our mind whatsoever as to what we had heard, and we knew it was coming from the creek. I don't think it was but fifteen seconds later that we heard yet another sound of boulders tumbling against each other like we had the first time. The two of us were very unsure as to what we were about to walk up on and began to slow our roll, gradually coming up to where the sound was emanating from. As we were closing in on the creek, we heard yet another large cracking sound of a boulder tumbling. Now, this really had our attention because the boulders in this creek are more than likely in the 50 pound plus range. Some of them are probably over a hundred pounds or more. This is a boulder field with water running through it. Who or what was tossing boulders around was anyone's guess at this point. We crept up to the point where we could now turn our heads to the right viewing the creek. There are a lot of low-lying trees in here of quite a few varieties. The creek has some trees growing up right through the boulders and is enveloped somewhat like a tunnel by trees on both sides. In the direction we were looking, the creek and boulder field meandered into the trees about 75 feet away from where we were crouched. It was at almost the apex of where the creek disappeared to the left into the trees that we saw a Sasquatch. The creature was standing directly under an area of the canopy where the sun was shining brightly on its back. It was standing on an angle where we were seeing its back and left arm in a hunched over position. It was holding what appeared to be a very heavy rock like it was nothing. It then flipped this boulder to its side and it kind of knelt down reaching into the water with its hand. It seemed to be feeling around the creek, and then it put its hand to its mouth. Thankfully, it wasn't facing towards us, for only a few moments later, it took a step back and picked up another boulder, flipped it to the side, and bent down to reach into the creek again. This time, it used its left hand, which we could see, and put it to its mouth. The creature was a hundred feet away from us, but... Because of the size of its hand and the smallness of whatever it was grabbing, we couldn't see anything. Mind you, I couldn't believe that the two of us had even stayed there for this amount of time and not run away. It was just a few seconds later that we heard some people talking and laughing coming up the trail from where we had. As soon as we heard the noise, the Sasquatch turned its head quickly to its right, which again was not looking at us at all, and took a couple of quick steps into the trees and was gone. About two minutes later, these three dudes came walking up on us and said, how are you girls doing today? Carol said to them, you dudes just scared off a Bigfoot. They were like, no way, man. Are you kidding me? Then Carol said, way, bro. He was standing right up there, flipping boulders around and eating something. As soon as you dudes started laughing back there, he heard you and split. The one dude said, I'm so sorry, man. Where was he? I told him, don't be sorry, because we were more than likely 10 seconds away from running out of here. You actually did us a favor. Then one of these guys walked up to where the Sasquatch had been. He was trying his best not to break his neck on the rocks. When we watched this dude trying to make his way back to where the Sasquatch was and how hard it was, it made me realize how easily the Sasquatch had done it. It was no chore at all for him to move around on these boulders. This dude tried to pick up some of the rocks and we thought he would drop a nut in the process. The Bigfoot was picking them up and holding them while he was looking around in the water. Just after that, this guy said that there was a big footprint right next to the creek where he was standing. Eventually, he made his way back over to us and they left. This thing was about eight or nine feet tall, from what we could guess, and it was picking up these huge rocks like it was holding a football. It looked like there was no effort or strain whatsoever on its body. The hair in the direct sunlight 
was reddish blonde, and the blonde could have very well been white or even gray. The sun was so bright on its back that it was actually creating a glare. It was really a hard thing to take in as we watched. I was kind of in a stupor, like I was waiting to wake up from a dream. It's very hard to explain, but that's the way it was. For the first time that we were there watching it, it felt like I was in a trance. I say that because I can't believe that the two of us were able to just sit there and not run. I have no idea how this type of thing can even be in this area and stay out of sight. It's not like we were in some big dark rainforest, and yet there it was. On to the next one. My buddies and I used to be avid ATVers and loved taking our off-road vehicles out to explore new places. I've since kind of lost interest and would rather be standing by some nice stream fishing with nary a care. But when I was younger, I really enjoyed getting out like that. At the time, I lived in Salt Lake City and it's a rat race. So every chance I could get, I liked to head out and get into the back country. When I was just getting started, we would stay in RV parks and just do day rides. But after a while, you don't want to have to come back and to retrace your route. So I started carrying a tent and gear on my ATV and spending a night or two out. It's kind of like backpacking in that you can't take a ton of stuff, but it's a lot easier and noisier, I might add. At the time this happened, the Paiute ATV trail was just getting started, and my buddy Carl and I decided to go down and give it a look. I'm not sure whose idea the trail was, but I'm pretty sure it was a coordinated effort by the communities of central Utah to try and drum up some tourism business. They took a bunch of old trails and mining roads and figured out how to connect them into one big trail that would go through their communities and then called it the Paiute Trail. ATVers like it because they know they're welcome and it's a good way to connect with other ATVers. The Paiute Trail has maps with descriptions too so you know what the trails are like and what to expect. Anyway, not to get into all of that, but my buddy and I decided to go down into the little town of Marysville which is just down the road from the Big Rock Candy Mountain, if you've ever heard of that. There's a nice RV park there that caters to ATVers, and you can leave your truck and trailer and ride the trail as long and as far as you want. The trail is over 900 miles long. We wanted to ride up to the portion that goes into the Tusher Mountain, as we'd never been there. The Tushers are pretty much off the beaten path, and most people don't even know they exist. They're volcanic and rise about 12,000 feet, marking the boundary between the Great Basin and the Colorado Plateau. They're rugged and really beautiful, but also very inaccessible, except some old mining and jeep roads. They're used some by cattlemen for grazing, but you almost never see anyone hiking or camping there, at least not when we were there. I think it's because they're not close to any cities or even towns for that matter. Anyway, off we went to the Tushers and Paiute Trail. We loaded up the ATVs on my trailer and headed down to Marysville, which isn't much of a town at all, just a few hundred or so people. We spent our first night at the RV park in our tent, then headed out the next morning on the Paiute Trail, which you can ride to straight out of the RV park, which was nice. We headed west and were soon going out of town on a forest road up Beaver Creek, where there were lots of cottonwoods and willows. Before long, we were in a pinion and juniper forest, and then the road quickly climbed up into spruce and fir. We were soon at another junction, where we headed south, deep into the heart of the Tushers, and deep into wild country that had inhabitants we had never heard of. After the incident I'm about to recount occurred, and we were back home, I found an old historic map of the area that had a name not on our newer map, Gorilla Gulch. If you ask anyone in the area about Gorilla Gulch, they'll probably just laugh, assuming they've even heard of it. But ask an old timer and you'll get a different reaction because there's a reason. 
It was called that. We discovered that reason, and I believe the original inhabitants of the gulch were at one time more plentiful. Two months after all this happened, I went back down there and asked around. One old rancher knew exactly what I was talking about, and he really didn't want to be quoted. But he told me most everybody that knew anything avoided that area like the plague. Well, unbeknownst to us, we were headed straight toward it. It was getting late, so we found a nice spot not far off the road and set up camp. It was great being outdoors, and the September weather was perfect, though a bit chilly at night up in the high country. We had a great dinner, built a fire, and really enjoyed being out. I slept like a baby in my little camp tent like a little Coleman Dome. The next day, we went further into the backcountry, higher into the tushers. We met a few other ATVers, but pretty much had the place to ourselves, at least until night hit. And I will say that our visitor that night turned us both into religious men, at least very temporarily. It was getting on towards evening, and we found a little dirt road that wound up into a small valley and decided to go on up it and see if we could find a good camp spot. The road wound along a small stream that was flanked by aspens and wild roads. We finally came to a little meadow that would make the perfect camp, and we stopped for the night and unloaded our gear. After setting up our little tents and laying out our sleeping bags, we set to collecting wood for a fire. We had brought some really nice, thick steaks and were looking forward to having them for dinner. It wasn't long until we had a nice fire going and steaks cooking on the grill. I kicked back against a rock and watched the last rays of sunset disappear into a red sky. It looked like we were maybe in for a weather change, but the forecast had been good, so I wasn't too worried. We were only going to be out one more night after that one. We were happy campers. If you've ever camped, you know the feeling of complete freedom and contentment you get when the day is done. Camps all tidy and dinners cooking over an open fire. The steaks took a while to cook, and in retrospect, I think the smell may have been what attracted our unexpected guest, though he came in too late for dinner. We talked about all those things you talk about around the campfire, and after the steaks were ready, we both sat in silence, eating and watching as the night sky unfolded its millions of stars. There's nothing like the stars in the clear sky of the Tushers. You feel like you could reach up there and touch them. Well, after dinner, we sat and talked a while longer and smoked cigars, something we didn't get to do at home. Why? And that's all I'll say about that, huh? We were tired, so we were about ready to call it a day when Carl, who was leaning against a rock, staring into the fire, sat straight up. I was in the middle of saying something, and he held his hand up like you do when you want someone to stop. I shut up and listened, but didn't hear a thing. What was it? I whispered. But just then I got my answer, deep in the distance, and I mean deep, as if miles away came a howling sound. You could tell that whatever was making it was really big, and had a huge set of lungs. The sound was a really low frequency to start with, then turned into a higher, shrieking yell that made my hair stand up. What the heck, Carl whispered. We both sat there in silence. I listened. Finally, I said, probably somebody camping way over there, horsing around. Geez, I hope so, Carl replied, because if it ain't, I'm wondering what it could be. A chill ran up my spine. For the first time ever, I've been in some bad situations and never had a chill run up my spine. Even though we were camped by a small stream, we could hear this thing over the burbling noises. We just sat there, quiet, and then the howling came again, but this time a bit closer. We both really listened up, wondering what it was. I whispered to Carl, man, this sure is weird. It sounds like it's coming in closer. He didn't answer because he was listening to the howl again. To me, it sounded like a combination of a wolf and a bull. Kind of snarling low sound, but drawn out almost into a bellow. 
it would go on and on for 20 or 30 seconds. I was getting worried. Were there wolves in this country? Supposedly not, but maybe a few still existed. But for some reason, that didn't seem right, as it had been a large animal making such a loud, drawn-out sound that it would carry like that. Whatever it is, it's coming our way, Carl remarked, looking a bit nervous. He got up and poked the fire, starting to put another small log on, then changed his mind. I got up and did a camp check. My pickup keys and wallet were in my day pack, which was in my tent, and I crawled in and got them. If we had to make a quick exit, that was one thing I couldn't leave behind. Carl saw what I was doing and did the same thing, gathering a few items and putting them into his day pack. He then asked, You think we may want to get out of here before long? I nodded my head, yes, just as the howling started again, only closer. Whatever this thing was, it wasn't shy. It acted like it wanted us to know it was coming. The howls were getting louder, and the sheer volume cut through the air like a hot knife through butter. I sat back down, trying to figure it all out. Maybe it's a bull elk in rut, I whispered to Carl. We'll feel pretty stupid about breaking camp over a bull elk. Whatever it is, it acts like it knows exactly where we are, Carl answered. Maybe, I said, or maybe it's just coming down the canyon for some other reason. But why would it be howling like that? Just then, the howling came again, but this time much closer. I could feel my heart start to beat faster. Carl jumped up, looking scared. Damn, that thing's moving fast, he said. I got up and went back into my tent and reconsidered. If we were leaving... I wanted my nice new down sleeping bag. I quickly stuffed it into its stuff sack, then grabbed the rest of my gear, a few clothes and a warm jacket. I went back out and crammed everything into the carrier on my ATV. Carl was shoveling dirt onto the fire. I walked over and poured what was left of in a gallon water jug onto it. The howling was now very close, and the air was echoing, and the sound it made my ears ring. I was getting ready to hit the road. Carl now also got his gear out of his tent and stuffed it into his ATV carrier. He stood there looking at me, then pulled his gun out. I don't know exactly what he had as I'm not a gun person, but it was some kind of handgun that he brought for protection from bears. He now stood there by his ATV looking like he was ready to shoot. The howling was now very close and I was scared stiff. Now we could hear the sound of tree branches breaking, as if something big was crashing through the aspens and underbrush coming at us fast. I panicked and jumped onto my ATV and started it up, afraid for a second that it might not start. As it sputtered a little, Carl put his gun in his jacket pocket and got on his ATV and started it. I turned and headed down the little dirt road, my ATV lights barely enough to see where I was going. Carl right behind me. He told me later that he nearly lost it more than once. As I was kicking up so much dust, he had trouble seeing anything. But there was no way we were staying. I got a good half mile down the road before I pulled over to make sure Carl was doing okay. He pulled up beside me and said he was fine and to keep going. Just then, we heard a deep growling next to the road and we both took off. But this time, Carl was in the front, and I was bringing up the rear, which I didn't like one bit. Another half mile, and Carl came to a screeching halt, and I nearly ran at Tim. There's something really big standing right in the middle of the road up there. I strained to see, but the dust had caught up to us, and I couldn't make out anything. Whatever it was, was incredibly fast to not follow us, but to actually get ahead. We sat there for a minute, then Carl started again, very slowly, kind of inching his way down the road. Suddenly, from ahead, a shriek sounded out, loud and clear, cutting through the air. The thing was very close. Carl stopped, pulled out his gun, and began frantically shooting. Now, let me say that Carl's a responsible gun owner and wouldn't shoot at anything unless he knew what it was. He was panicked, but he still shot into the air over the head of whatever was on the road. All we wanted at that point was for it to move so we could get out of there. Whatever it was must have moved 
because Carl hit the accelerator and tore out of there. I was right behind him, and I swear that when I went by the spot where he said something had been standing, I saw a pair of glowing red eyes in the trees, eyes that were in the head of something or somebody that stood a good eight feet off the ground. Man, that shook me up. I gunned it until I was right on Carl's bumper, and I kept looking behind me, afraid I was being followed. We were now at the main forest service road and turned back the way we had come. The road wasn't as rough, so we made it in good time. Neither of us stopped until we came down into the little town of Marysville. Then Carl pulled over. His eyes had a crazed look to them. I told him we should go back to the RV campground and see if anyone was still up. We could maybe rent a cabin for the night. He just nodded his head yes, and that's what we did. It was the middle of the night, but we managed to get our cabin. Yet, I don't think either of us slept much. The next day, we loaded up the ATVs, got some breakfast on the way out, and drove straight home. So, if you're ever on the Paiute Trail over the east side of the Tusher Mountain, out of Marysville, Utah, and you see a little dirt road winding up into a small canyon with a stream, go on up and see if our tents are still there. If they are, and they're not ripped to shreds, you can have them. I don't know if we were in Gorilla Gulch or not, but if so, we sure didn't enjoy our stay there, and I'm sure never going back. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!